Hey everybody, welcome to The Grind. It is a coffee-based podcast, so then we can stay awake and severely caffeinated, potentially coffee, over-caffeinated. then adulting. <laughs> uh, my name is Arnell Alisea, I'm with Visionary Business Development, and I am here with... Michelle, uh, possibly. All right, and we are at, where are we? We're River Road... Coffee, coffee house, coffee house and, and, po- and popsicle, right? Yes. yes. Coffee and popsicles. Which how is amazing. could you possibly? <laughs> how could you possibly not, not anymore? Coffee how could you pop- possibly <laughs> want anymore? <laughs> yeah, I love that. And so we are here to talk about overcoming the four forces of employee disengagement, and uh, we actually always have a problem where before we turn the camera on, we end up having the entire conversation <laughs> at least one or two times over. So this time we remember to turn it to go live first so yes. we're talking about employee engagement you know what is this or lack thereof the lack thereof right so uh, you you were rattling off a pretty interesting statistic 21 percent according to this article predictive index is 21 percent of employees say that they are motivated to do their job and exceed in their performance, Mm -hmm. only 21%. So the reverse of that means that, what, my math's right, 79% are not motivated to do their job? Yeah. That's a huge statistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so Gallup produces a state of the American workforce report uh, at at, at some point over each year, and uh, it always says the same thing, that the majority of the workforce is either disengaged or actively disengaged. And to be disengaged is basically your workforce that is disengaged is producing a dollar for for a dollar right so they're not making you any money you know they're just kind of paying their own salaries just to get by actively disengaged means that they're stealing paper clips <laughs> and they're costing you money basically through through their through their malfeasance so they're actually the ones that usually get canned but they're the ones that really cycle around the companies so your top so your top 20% the top 20% of company revenue actually comes from the top from the top 20 I'm sorry company revenue comes from the top 20% of your in, of, of your of your employees which is terrifying because that means that for yeah for for How every hundred yeah have, right yeah for every hundred employees only 21 are actively bringing you in money, right? So we're gonna talk about how different methods on how to uh, increase that from, from, from 20%, because 20% is just an average, yeah. right? So right. You're, you're, most companies fall along the spectrum and you know who you are if, if you're looking at your employees and being like, what am I doing wrong, right? So we're gonna talk about that a little well, bit. Well, I wanna and I want to talk about what engagement means. So if you look at an engagement pyramid, and keep it simple, so there's three pieces to that. Those three pieces would be, do they understand what they're supposed to do? Do they ha- do they have a desire or passion or natural curiosity to do it? And then can they achieve it? Do they have the skill? And so if you don't have yeses in all three of those camps, you don't have an engaged employee. So we should be looking at that the whole, you know, throughout the life cycle of an employee with their tenure in the organization. So it, there's the role. I think the article talks about the role. Mm-hmm. It talks about the manager. It talks about fit. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember the, the fourth one, but yeah, we we'll have to look it up. Right. So we so so let's work it from from like an HR perspective because that's really where the candidate where a candidate first becomes an employee, right? And then now you're in the employee manager relationship. And so, you know, we were to, we were discussing a little earlier how, um, from an HR perspective, like how do you get to know a candidate in such a manner that when you integrate them and onboard them, your manager then knows and understands what they need to do to motivate that employee? Because you were discussing about uh, how you had a client where uh, I'll, I'll let you yeah. So I'll let you take that. So what that we were talking about was. I we just had a conversation last week with a group of businesses and those we were talking about retention those businesses were in the room because they're struggling with keeping their employees I had one particular business raise her raise she's a manager leader in that organization raise her hand and say I have managers that are afraid to talk to their employees because they're afraid of what they're gonna hear what the what I mean, so if we're if we're afraid of the information, so we're not going to ask. I said, well, it's your responsibility as a leader to make sure that's happening. 
to make sure that you're finding out the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because if you're sitting in the room for retention and you're having a problem, then that's part of the problem. Right. right. And so, and so the the fourth thing that we were to, that we needed to talk about was culture, right? And so this is kind of a how do you set up your company culture mm. where people feel the safe to uh, bring up the issues, right? Yeah, and that's, that's at, at every single level. And as a leader, as an executive, you have to set that. You have to set that tone. And you have to make and you have to uh, make programs available where even if you have to anonymize it, right? It's I mean obviously it's better to come together as a team and really to, and really talk through all the issues that might be going on and, and 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 places where you're losing money. But what it really comes down to is like as an executive is creating that culture to begin with, and you can do that at any time. Well, and I think you can also pay attention to your attraction. So I mean, if you look at the life cycle of a particular resource, you've got attraction. Hiring, engagement, accountability, and retention. And so you drag that all the way through the process. But attraction starts with what is your vision? What are your values? Are you writing that into your performance plans and your job description? So you're hiring and asking the right questions. Right. And that gets to your culture. Do you even know what your values are? So you're right. attracting the right people in the first place? Right. I don't know. And most people, if you ask that question, their businesses go, uh, I don't know. Right. And, and if you think about you think about what uh, you're building, you're building a relationship and in a, in a business yes the relationship with the with the customer is very important but equally so with the employee because they're an extension of your of your culture and what you even started started the business for right right so um, are you asking the right questions during the hiring process and, right. and, and are you holding to those motivating factors uh, as a manager right yes. now are you you know we, we talked about like and it's and it sounds kind of funny but like love languages mm -hmm. right um, what's asking people what motivates them because not everybody's motivated by money chances are that the non-tangible like hey being right. able to spend more That's time right. with the family yep. and if you're able to somehow somehow create uh, their role to to that in, in, and motivate their role through these intangibles, they're going to be very productive. You know what's interesting about talking about that, Arnell, is that I, so if we look at volunteer organizations, right, you're not paying those people. You, you have to find out what their motivator is. So not all businesses actually ask the question why they're here. Case in point, the passion, the desire, natural curiosity. But in a volunteer organization, you have no choice. You have to if you want to keep them engaged right. and you want to get them on board and you want them to come back to continue to help. That is the key and the lock for a volunteer organization. It should be a natural byproduct of our business operation right. too. Right. So now when we're talking about, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of times when you hire, you could hire an employee and they may not be exactly perfect for the role that you hire them for. And uh, what ends up happening, what I think what ends up happening sometimes is, you know, you get frustrated from underperformance and you have a tendency to just maybe can an individual as opposed to looking at their strengths, looking at their weaknesses and how they present opportunities and threats to your organization. Like maybe the threat is they don't, they're not very good at that, at that front end role, but you know what, as an analytics person, maybe they're great. And as opposed to then just letting them go and then going through a very costly and, right. and repetitious uh, uh, onboarding process and you know an applicant tracking process, you know you just turn around and you say, hey, you know what, we have a better position for you. Or if they have a very unique skill set, finding a way to make that unique skill set provide value and production for for your organization and creating their own role. I have a friend who's a uh, he's actually a, an aviary geneticist, so he's a very, very wow. fancy vet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, he actually. I'm glad you find yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yes, exactly. That <laughs> so he, so he actually found um, uh, found a company where they valued what he, uh, what his expertise was so much that they created a role just for him, and he traveled all of Southeast Asia to uh, um, basically giving presentations and teaching people about uh, about chickens. That's funny. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. That's yeah, he, yeah. He sent me a picture of uh, you know, he was uh, he was driving around in a Ferrari, 
and that was a company vehicle. So <laughs> kudos to him. But he spent like you know he spent he spent like you know forty eight hours in the air for four hours on the ground. So That's you know funny. so he moved on. But but the point being is that hey, you see somebody with exceptional talent, yes. and it could be anywhere. It doesn't it doesn't have to be through necessarily through an applicant tracking system. If you're if you find somebody that you're having a great conversation with. You know, in a coffee shop. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe that's the place that you hire them and bring them in and say, hey, you know what? I want to get to know you better and see if there's if there's something that we could work out. And maybe that's how you find a really exceptional employee. Well, and I think the other part there is that there may be an, a, a time where you have to manage that resource out. Right. Mm -hmm. That is sometimes that they, they are not a fit culturally or for whatever reason you have to manage them out. However, we still have. A responsibility to check on engagement with a, some regular checkpoint of are, do they understand what they're supposed to do do they have a desire to do it and do they have the skill to do it and can we get them there right because if they have the desire right back to the motivation if they have that you can you can get them trained up to do the work and you can make sure that they understand what they're supposed to do but if they don't have the motivation yeah, that's yeah, true. you might have to. They might that's have true. to. Be, yeah, absolutely. Like, oh. Yeah, 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 for sure. So um, I'm, I'm going to work towards wrapping up, but um, I want to focus on what separates the Fortune 500 companies from the companies that end up going out of business. And it's actually a piece of pr proprietary research that I had done uh, quite some years back, and I'm sure the numbers have changed a little bit, but the premise has not. Right. For the difference between a Fortune 500 company and one that falls off the map is about is about a 20 percent engagement difference wow. from their top uh, from uh, from their top employees. So, uh, Fortune 500 companies they're, they're working towards 25 and 30 percent, which is not all that high, no. right? No, of their workforce being actively engaged, right? So they're they're producing the bulk of revenue per employee, mm -hmm. right? And then on the opposite side of that, you have the companies that are failing, which are somewhere around like 10 percent. Okay, so that's wow. not a huge gap, but right. yet you think, or it seems like. Right, but this is the difference literally between a company that's in the billions of dollars in revenue and on and in Forbes magazine year over year mm. versus one that is snuffed out of existence through incompetence. I guess the point is that you need to be mindful of the engagement or disengagement, checking to see mm -hmm. if it's a problem with regularity mm -hmm. and then managing them up or out yes. as necessary. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that, cheers. cheers. <laughs> Thank you, River Roads. Have a good one, guys. It's delicious. <laughs> and I'm going to go get myself a red sangria popsicle now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much for, jo you. for joining me. It was and, great. Uh, good good we'll chat. See you next time on an episode of The Grind. Later. Later.